So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to my presentation. So, let me start the session architecting Kubernetes based internal platforms, essential patterns, and practices. So my name is Hiroshi Hayakawa. I'm a platform engineer working on working for LY Corporation's private cloud division. And LY Corporation is one of the largest internet company in Japan, offering a wide variety of services. For example, communication app, uh, internet portals, and news media, e-commerce, and so on. So we have been operating platforms at a large scale for a long time. So I hope to share that experience as well. And I contribute to CNCF, CNCF tag up delivery, primarily in the field of platform engineering. This session is largely based on platform engineering and CNCF project achievement. Thanks to all contributors within the TAG and related open source projects. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm in trouble. <laughs> also, this is an important thing. In addition, I have written books on Kubernetes in Japan, Japanese. And I love building DIY keyboard. And this is the one I'm currently using at my desk. Cool. So anyway, today I'd like to talk to you about building, building Kubernetes-based platforms for application developers. And I've divided my presentation into three sections. First, let me start by giving you some background. And next, we'll dive into building our Kubernetes-based IDP. We'll begin with a high-level overview of the technical and organizational structure. Then, we'll move on to discuss the more detailed technical considerations that are important for implementation. And finally, we'll wrap things up with a conclusion and summarizing the key takeaways. <coughs> right, let's get started with the background. So first, I would like to start by talking about what platform engineering is. To understand it, I think it would be helpful to look back at the trends of recent IT paradigms. For example, DevOps, microservices, and so on. These topics in the slide have common purpose, which is speeding up the application release cycle. However, on the other hand, they increase the amount of knowledge that developers need to learn and responsibilities they need to take. For example, to put the CICD into practice, developers need to learn CICD tools. This creates a problem in that developers are unable to focus on developing their applications. So platform engineering addresses this issue it reduces developers' time for doing such practices by providing an in-house platform called IDP. This platform automates non-essential tasks in application development and is known as a, a internal developer platform. Yep. So you might think that Kubernetes can also be an IDP in that sense that it reduces non-essential tasks in developing and operating applications. And in fact, Kubernetes can do that. For example, it abstracts underlying computing resources and applications can be managed declaratively using text files called manifest. And it can also automate restarting, scaling, and updating applications. 
Furthermore, we can extend Kubernetes to meet our organizational specific requirements. Now, let's think about using Kubernetes as an IDP. Since most of major cloud providers offer Kubernetes as a service capabilities, so developers can get clusters in this way, as shown in this slide. But is that enough? Of course, we know things are not so easy. The initial cluster does not have the necessary settings for actually running production workloads, such as RBAC settings for managing access rights, or a network policy which controls traffic routes, and so on. And then, after deploying our application, it is necessary to monitor and upgrade the cluster. So anyway, just having a cluster means there's a still a lot of work to let to do other than application development and operation. So just having a vanilla Kubernetes cluster is not enough for enough for an IDP. So what exactly at the developer's demand. I believe we can say one of the demand is out of the box Kubernetes as a service for running their applications. This means they can have a pre-configured ready to use cluster whenever they need it. And another one is X as a service. This means that developers don't even have to be aware of be aware of clusters, and they can get common functions in the form of services, such as uh, database as a service or messenger as a service, and so on. So let's build our DP meeting developers demand. In the next section, we'll start taking a high-level look at Kubernetes-based IDPs, both technical and organizational aspects. And after that, we will look into more detailed technical considerations of the architecture. So this is the second section. Let me, let's get into the high-level technical and organizational structure. And I'd like to share a little bit of history here. <laughs> a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it was around 2020. Kubernetes was incredibly popular and was at the top of the list of cool technologies that developers wanted to try. But at the same time, everyone started to realize something. Using Kubernetes was too much hassle, and managing it was extremely difficult. Uh, that when many companies came to a similar conclusion, gather Kubernetes experts to take over the management and operation of clusters. And thus, the role of the Kubernetes, Kubernetes administrator was born. So anyway, the having a dedicated cluster administrator is a common approach. In this diagram, developers contact the cluster administrator via Slack or something to request the creation of clusters. The administrator sets up the cluster and applying any necessary configurations to ensure production quality and align with organizational policies. And compared to having each developer create clusters by themselves, this approach is preferable because it standardizes cluster settings and maintains a consistent quality. And I think 
This approach can work well for smaller organizations like startups. But however, as the organization grows and the demand for clusters increases, this approach will not be able to handle the volume of requests from developers. And additionally, cluster management involves tasks such as updating add-ons, updating the cluster itself, and monitoring cluster health. So doing these tasks manually would likely be challenging. But while there are challenges with the cluster admin approach, I believe the structure of the previous slide is very good at start point of our Kubernetes IDP. In other words, what I mean is first replace the box in the previous slide, previous slide to abstracted concepts. For example, chat system to interface, the task of a cluster administrator to provisioner, and cluster itself to tenant. And we can consider this as a basic architecture of a Kubernetes as a service IDP. And then recreate the interface and provisioner as more automated things. It will solve problems such as a lack of scalability due to the cluster administrator relies on manual work. And uh, as for tenant, I will explain this in more detail later. There are different options for which unit of cluster provided to developers, such as namespace or entire clusters. But for now, we are treating it as an abstract concept tenant. And we should have a dedicated team to develop and maintain the interface and provisioner and manage tenants, which we can call the platform team or the Kubernetes as a service team. And basically, the platform team should avoid manual cluster creation. And instead, they should develop and operate automated interfaces and provisioners. In this sense, of course, platform teams will need more software engineering skills than traditional cluster administrators. Yeah, and this is another example of a fully, fully automated Kubernetes as a service IDP based on the previous architecture. We would provide a CLI and or a GUI as an interface and cross-plane as a provisioner. Cross-plane is an incubating level project under the CNCF. And it is an orchestration tool that enables managing various infrastructure resources with unified API, including cloud providers like uh, AWS, GCP, and plain Kubernetes. And by the way, control plane itself can also be deployed on Kubernetes. When a developer requests to create cluster via CLI or GUI, it sends a HTTP request to the provisional cluster in the cross-plane format called composition. And then cross-plane catches the request and create a cluster on AWS EKS and finally set policies and deploy add-ons to the cluster by calling Helm. In this way, the entire process of providing cluster is fully automated. And then next, let's walk through how to implement the provisioner and the interface. So we'll check the provisioner first. In this diagram, 
The vertical axis represents scalability and the sense of managing Kubernetes clusters, uh, ease of managing of clusters. And the horizontal axis shows the initial cost of de developing uh, uh, provisioner. And here I placed the solutions commonly seen in my experience. So far, I've already introduced the two examples at the both end, but there are also examples which use Terraform templates or integrate these templates with CD pipelines, which enables applying the templates automatically. And the two approach in the upper right can upper right can create clusters without any manual work. This is especially necessary to handle a large number of requests. And so when choosing which approach to use for your IDP, it's also important to consider the skill set of the platform team. Next, let's take, look, take a look at interface options. In this diagram, please pay attention to the vertical axis. It indicates usability of the interface. And I press the item labeled Expose the Provisioners API in the center. It means, for example, in the area cross plane example, developers create cross plane format requests and send them directly to the provisioner. This approach is relatively simple but limits flexibility in, cha in changing the provisioner's API, and it could make things difficult to maintain the provisioner. In this regard, it may be better to either use a tracking system or the method on the right side, which introduces an additional step between the developers and the provisioners as CLI or GUI. And of course, it is, it's also important to eliminate manual tasks for the platform team to handle large volumes, volumes of cluster creation requests. It is similar to the provisioner. So for I explain the architecture of Kubernetes as a service IDP, I'd like to briefly summarize it here. Uh, first, a Kubernetes as a service IDP enables developers to access ready to use Kubernetes clusters out of the box. This frees developers from tasks to meet organizational requirements or managing clusters, allowing them to focus on running their applications. Next, to build a CARS IDP, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's helpful to see it as being composed of three elements, the interface, project runner, and tenant. And we've looked at example of implementation. Finally, when selecting technologies for the interface and provisioner, it's good to consider functionality, uh, development costs, and the platform team's skill set. So that's all about the Kubernetes as a service IDP. So let's move on to the X as a service, for example, database as a service. And uh, I would like to tell you an, another of the story. A long time, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Please let me read. Kubernetes IDPs have greatly helped reduce developers' tasks with, with clusters pre-configured and readily available for self-service. Developers can now deploy and release applications quickly. However, developers' needs never stop evolving. Now that Kubernetes is easier to use, 
they began to think our system also needs an RDB and a messaging queue. We are using managed services in the cloud, but they come with a high cost. And now we have Kubernetes at our disposal. So <laughs> anyway, developers just want to use RDB, and they, do, they don't even want to be conscious of Kubernetes cluster. But this is something that the problem, the platform teams has a bit of a bad feeling about this. Now let's look at a simple example of what happens next. In this slide, the developer is deploying a Kubernetes operator called Vitesse into their own cluster. Introducing Kubernetes operators allows you to extend the Kubernetes API server by yourself. In this case, Vitesse adds additional APIs and enabling the creation and management of a scalable RDB within the cluster. Providing a similar experience to database as a service. By the way, Crossplane, which I mentioned earlier, is also an example of a Kubernetes operator. Crossplane extends Kubernetes by adding APIs for managing cloud resources. So, but what's the problem? For most major Kubernetes operators, the day one experience is pretty good, and you can start using it right away. However, when it comes to day two operations, it's a different story. In the case of VTS, day two operations means that we'll need to manage tune and troubleshoot the database which is running as a container, container on Kubernetes. So this requires not only a deep understanding of RDBs, but also knowledge of Kubernetes and the VTS operator itself. And additionally, updating the VTS operator is necessary, but it must be done with careful attention to version compatibility with Kubernetes. Therefore, it's quite challenging for developers or a platform team to operate additional Kubernetes operators on top of their primary responsibilities. So if you want an X as a service IDP, my recommendation is to establish a dedicated team for the service. In this setup, the team would create a cluster using the CAS IDP and configure operators like VTS on it and provide an interface for developers to use that database service. This role requires not only ability to manage the operators, but also deep expertise in the database itself. So making an independent team like this is suitable for an XRS IDP. Of course, creating a new team is costly, so we need to carefully consider the cost effectiveness of this setup, particularly if demand for such service is high enough within the organization. And if you develop a new interface for X as a service, I recommend to consider consistency, consistency with other IDPs, AD, uh, with other IDPs API. At least we should already have an interface for the Kubernetes IDP at this point. So let's think about providing a similar experience between these IDPs from the design phase. Having a consist consistent interface not only enhances the developer ex experience, but also makes it easier for them to adapt new IDP capabilities. 
Now that we've covered the high-level architecture, so let's move on to some more details, detailed technical considerations. Of course, there are many considerations about this setup, but here we would like to focus on just two topics. Isolation and multi-tenancy options and how to implement single sign-on across multiple clusters. And let's start with isolation and multi-tenancy. This topic, in other words, is about determining the units in which Kubernetes clusters should be provided to, be de to developers. <laughs> the options include namespace, logical cluster, and cluster, actual cluster. With namespace, developers use Kubernetes namespaces as their tenancy unit. They are given access only to the features available within the specific namespace of the cluster. Since a single cluster can contain multiple tenants, compute resources are shared among tenants. And logical cluster involves creating multiple logically isolated clusters within a single Kubernetes cluster and assigning them to the developers. Compared to namespace-based tenancy, developers have more freedom in utilizing Kubernetes features. At the same time, logical clusters still allow for computer resource sharing within a single cluster, so enhancing resource efficiency. However, logical cluster and the native Kubernetes feature, so additional components like V cluster are needed. And last one, cluster. Actual cluster provides a separate independent cluster for each tenant. And, and developers have full control over an entire cluster, offering the highest level of flexibility. However, because computer resources are, resources are not shared, this option tends to be less resource efficient. Now, this table is sourced from the V cluster documentation. It compares each tenant option. The options on the right side offer higher levels of isolation. What become, what become clear here is that the stronger the isolation, the greater the freedom in using cluster features. But this also tends to come with inefficiency in terms of cost and resource utilization. However, in practice, there are few additional points to consider. First, logical cluster requires an extra component to implement, which adds complexity of the cluster itself. And from operational and management perspective, each tenancy option comes with specific considerations. First, in the namespace per tenancy, Kubernetes features that span multiple namespaces cannot be utilized. This becomes particularly problematic when extending the Kubernetes API using Kubernetes operators, such as, uh, sorry, as such extensions can only be applied cluster-wide. So if the operator needs updating, you must ensure that changes to the extended API will not impact all tenant users. In practice, it may be best to assume that developers won't be able to install operators in the namespace per tenant model. Next, both namespace and logical cluster models which uh, resources within a single cluster 
require attention to the noisy neighbor problem. This issue arises when one tenant's application consumes significant resources, potentially degrading the performance of other tenants' applications. To limit, while Kubernetes offers features to limit resource usage per container or namespace, these measures don't fully eliminate the problem. And in the cluster pertinent model, the platform teams, sorry, uh, in the cluster pertinent model, the platform teams tend to manage uh, a lot of, a large number of clusters. In the fact, um, our company handles 2,000 Kubernetes clusters in production and uh, the platform team have to make a lot of efforts to automating to handle these, uh, these large number of clusters. So next, let's look at how to implement single sign-on across multiple clusters. The reason single cluster Sorry, the reason single sign-on is necessary is that as CAS users work with multiple clusters and the number of CAS instances grows, logging, log into each individual cluster becomes increasingly burdensome. The more extensively an IDP is used, the more single sign-on enhances the developer experience with the IDP. And this diagram is illustrates an example architecture for implementing single sign-on across multiple clusters. In this diagram on the left side, identity management and authentication are centralized with an open ID connect provider. Once developers log into the ID provider, they can obtain a token for accessing Kubernetes APIs. And all clients can make API requests using this ID token. For OIGC providers, they are, potentially, uh, pro they are proprietary services like Okta and Ping Identity and so on but it's also possible to use open source solutions from CNCF, such as Keycloak or DEX. And for authorization, the ascents enables centralized management of access rights. Ascents is also a CNCF project with engineers from our company actively contributing to an leading its development. That concludes this overview. My explanation of, the, of single sign-on has been relatively abstracted. So if anyone is interested in more technical details, please feel free to reach out to me. And today, we have a booth on the fourth floor showcasing some open source projects we are actively contributing to, including Athens. So please stop by the booth and ask any questions if you are interested. So that brings to me the end of my presentation. To conclude, I'd like to review the lessons and key takeaways. First, using an IDP reduces the time developers spend on non-essential tasks and enables them to focus on application development and operations. Second, Kubernetes is highly effective in implementing an IDP. A tailored Kubernetes cluster allows developers to focus on running their applications without dealing with cluster setup and management tasks. And a Kubernetes-based Exas provides internal developers with the same experience 
as cloud provider services. Third, the right technical and organizational architecture are key to success of uh, Kubernetes-based IDPs. And finally, while there are some technical considerations, they could be addressed by integrating cloud-native technologies. And before the finish, I'd like to highlight the cloud-native technologies introduced throughout this presentation and express my gratitude. And of course, beyond the technologies presented here, there are numerous others uh, that are highly effective in supporting the success of platform engineering. Mm -hmm. If you haven't yet had the chance to contribute, I hope this inspires your interest. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them now. Any questions? Yep. Arigato gozaimasu. I, I appreciate your talk. I, I've given a talk similar to this one in the past at, at KubeCon in, uh, in um, Amsterdam in 2023. Yeah. I, I'm a part of the, the CNOE organization, and we have a tool that we call IDP Builder that is a Kubernetes-based solution for building IDPs. Um, I see that, that uh, you, you, you speak about the development of operators. Have, have you um, seen any tooling um, beyond like Kube Builder or, or similar that, that assists in the development of those operators? Um, it, it, is, it is difficult for a difficult learning curve for platform teams mm -hmm. to be able to create their own operators. Crossplane does make that a little bit easier, but the creation of operators themselves, I, I, I think that there is a very good path for creating IDPs with operators, but the learning curve is very difficult. Yeah. Do you have any experience with that? Uh, sorry, I don't have any experience about uh, other tools other than uh, builder or uh -huh. building a Kubernetes Hi. operators. But um, so honestly, I, my, our team is a uh, we can handle the such a uh, extra service mm -hmm. with building and operating. Mm -hmm. uh, Kubernetes operators, because I think the members of the platform teams are highly experienced within the right. Go language and uh, mm, or something software engineering mm -hmm. terms, right. and so I mentioned about the skill set of the uh, platform teams and. Uh, I think I believe our team's success is depend on the considerations of platform team skill set. Right. So, so it makes it, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will come speak to you after. I think yeah. it, it is what we would call table stakes for platform teams to be able to build operators. They would need to yeah. know these things right. first, and so the learning curve. Once you get here, you can then start to build your IDPs much easier. Oh, all right, thank you very much. Please talk. Thanks for the presentation. So during the presentation, you mentioned about the cluster, kind of the uh, cluster uh, application there, or three ways there, use the namespace and a logical cluster yeah. and the cluster there. So wh what do you choose eventually? Like, uh, do you see any kind of a challenge while you choose this way in, in the old time and share some. <laughs> Sorry, could you, could you please repeat that? The, the, how do you create uh, your uh, cluster there for your IDP? Our team, about our yeah, team. Yeah, ah, yeah. yeah, your solution. Yeah. Our solution is uh, using a real cluster per tenant model. And uh, honestly, we building uh, our provisioner from scratch and uh, it is a 
uh, specified for uh, handling the thousands of clusters. So we use such approach. And yes, uh, but uh, in common cases, it, I think it's enough to use. Uh, so will this be a real physical node or, or just a part of a? No, uh, no and uh, we have a physical data center, but uh, deploying a open stack layer and okay. and our operators are interact with the open stack API and create a cluster on open stack virtual machine. So one, two, three, which one is that again? Uh, I mean, or a uh, plus three cluster, okay. but uh, the cluster is built on top of virtual machine nodes. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your attention. So, and we have uh, a lot of remaining contents in this event. Enjoy the event. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.